On this edition of Great Lakes Now, how this winter's warm weather has affected Great Lakes ice fishing. Because of the inconsistency of ice conditions here, the avid fisherman has sought out other destinations. And in early 2019, we told you about drinking water contaminated with PFAS in West Michigan. It killed my husband. It took away my property values. It's taken everything from me. A year later, what's being done to address PFAS pollution around the Great Lakes region? We bring you the latest. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com slash foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Duttweiler. Welcome to Great Lakes Now. Recreation on the Great Lakes doesn't stop when winter comes. But what happens when winter doesn't bring the cold temperatures we expect? Depending on where you are, that can have a big effect on activities like ice fishing. Partner station TVO brings us the story. Part of it is the excitement of reeling in a fish, um, catching a, you know, the big one, you know, your heart gets racing as soon as you get that little bite and you want to reel it in. That's like the, that adrenaline. On Manitoulin Island in Upper Lake Huron, ice fishing has a long and rich history. The island has 108 freshwater lakes and the water is home to some of the most popular species to catch, including rainbow trout and lake trout. For the past 12 years, the Wikwemakon First Nation, situated on the northeastern part of Manitoulin, has hosted an ice fishing derby on the island. This year, the weekend-long competition spanned over two bodies of water, Lake Manitou and Manitowaning Bay. What we were trying to do was kind of uh, trying to find tourism within the shoulder season because obviously Manitoulin is uh, beautiful during the summertime, but not too many people come in the winter. So that's what we wanted to try to attract. The tournament provides a big economic boost to the area. This year marked the biggest turnout to date. More than 700 anglers descended on Manitoulin Island for the competition, 400 of whom were visiting from out of town. We have a lot of people from northeastern Ontario, um, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie along that Highway 17 corridor. But now we're starting to notice that people are coming in from uh, the states too, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and as far east as Quebec. Um, so they're coming here, uh, they want to come and fish the pristine hard water of Manitoulin Island. The red stamp, that means you're fishing Manitowaning Bay. Yep. They will only weigh in Anglers start their day bright and early. Yeah. Yeah. Checking in and making their way on the ice to one of the 300 pre-drilled holes. Once they have their rod out and their reel in the water, it's just a matter of time. But with $50,000 in cash and prizes, this derby is worth the wait. If they catch a fish, uh, their objective is to keep it alive and bring it to the closest weigh-in station. 3.2. You know, you might not catch nothing uh, for a whole day, but at least you know, you're out there with your friends and telling, you know, jokes and stories. And, you know, it's just that camarad camaraderie of, um, you know, being with family and friends. Even though both lakes had completely frozen over, building up more than a foot of ice, the temperature this year was notably warmer. Over the 12 years, it's hard to pinpoint the exact uh, depth of the ice. It, it fluctuates every year. Um, obviously, we can uh, notice the, the changes uh, due to climate change, right? Some, some years are warmer, some years are way colder. Uh, one year, it could be minus 40. Another year, like this year, uh, it could go up to 2 degrees. The ice fishing season in the province can range from several months in the northern regions to just a few weeks in southwestern Ontario. For anglers in Mitchell's Bay, the season is literally a wash. Located on the eastern shore of Lake Sinclair, Mitchell's Bay has a population of 200 and was once home to television host and fishing icon Red Fisher, whose fishing program, The Red Fisher Show, aired in Canada for more than two decades. I'm Red Fisher here, and this is Scuttlebutt Lodge, the tall tale capital of the world. Mitchell's you Bay is a one-road village, um, a dead-end road that ends at the lake. And the lake is what brings people to our community. It's what drew Jim Williams and his family to the area. He grew up in nearby Chatham, Kent, and has fond memories of Mitchell's Bay as a child. 
my parents had a wooden shanty that they would park the first week of January out in the bay. Uh, we would snowmobile to it on the weekends. And there was a pot belly wood stove in the shanty. And uh, my mom would make chili at home and we would snowmobile as children to the shanty. Uh, my dad would cut holes in the ice for fishing. We would stay inside the shanty and eat chili. Uh, it's kind of a comfort memory of mine, of my childhood. In 1996, his father would go on to buy the local restaurant in Mitchell's Bay. Jim would eventually take over and now runs it with his wife and four kids. Parkside. Business has been good, particularly in the summer, but during the winter, it's been anyone's guess. It's been a mild winter. Um, we have had some snowfall. Um, the old cliche, the only consistent thing about our weather has been inconsistency. It's recommended that ice cover be a minimum of four inches for walking on. That has not been the case for majority of the season on Lake St. Clair. Uh, this lake offers opportunities unlike any of the bigger Great Lakes. Not that we're a Great Lake, but because it's shallow and because it's small. Yeah, that's a nice one. In the winter, these waters are swarming with yellow perch. 2014 was a really good year for us as far as ice conditions. 2017 was another good year as far as ice conditions, so the lake froze completely over, and probably the average thickness was 24 inches or two feet. So on a Saturday or Sunday, I could estimate that there'd be 500 vehicles here in the bay, where both parking lots at the end of the road were full. Along with the restaurant, Jim rents out these cabins. During a good winter, he's booked solid. I look back and I didn't realize that we, you know, had rented that many cabins or that many rooms uh, in those years in good conditions. Um, and this year, virtually nothing. And if you look west on a clear day, you can see the skyline of Detroit. With its proximity uh, to the U.S., Mitchell's Bay has historically been a hotspot for American anglers. We're so close to the U.S. It's, a, it's literally a half an hour boat ride. But to according Detroit, to Jim, they are no longer coming, and it's and a direct result of inconsistent ice conditions. So what's happened in the, the time from 1996-97 to present is the avid fisherman, the avid ice angler, um, because of the inconsistency of ice conditions here, has sought out other destinations, um, Lake Simcoe, Lake Nipissing, places where they know from on a year-to-year -year basis that they'll have reliable ice conditions. It's not just bad for the ecosystem, it's really bad for the economy in a winter like this. Gail Kranzenberg is an engineering and public policy professor at Hamilton's McMaster University. She's worked for the province's Ministry of Environment and was the director of the Great Lakes Regional Office of the International Joint Commission. What we don't often think about is the recreational attributes of the Great Lakes in the winter and the small villages and towns that have built a reputation on snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, uh, ice fish on the lakes, and it's a huge draw to the small communities that have that ability to have a small embayment and have the ice there. In 2014, I think we had almost 90% ice cover across all of the Great Lakes, and now in some areas it's ice-free, in some areas it's a few percent. As of early March, less than 9% of the Great Lakes were covered in ice. The globe is warming, so we will warm. But a changing climate means more extreme events in our region. We may have more extreme cold winters, extremely warm winters. For Jim's business, this winter represents thousands of dollars in lost revenue. He's hopeful the season can be salvaged. We have no reason to believe that we will go back to the way it was 30 years ago. So I don't know that my children will ever experience what I did. We have to adapt to the changes that have happened and move forward with it. And if we can go out for two hours and enjoy the pop-up shanty and a little bit of fishing and then come in, at least we're still able to enjoy that experience. As long as I can expose my kids to that opportunity, then I think that that's a positive thing. For more on how the warm winter has affected outdoor recreation and to see how this winter's Great Lakes ice cover compares to previous years, visit us at greatlakesnow.org. In March of 2019, we premiered our documentary, The Forever Chemicals, about a family of chemicals known as PFAS that's contaminating our groundwater around our region and around the country. Since then, there have been some important developments, so we're revisiting the story to bring you the latest.
The Teflon that makes your pans non-stick. The Gore-Tex that makes your jacket waterproof but breathable. And the Scotchgard that keeps your upholstery stain-free. All of it has one thing in common. They were all created using PFOS, a family of thousands of chemical compounds that don't break down over time, which is why they've been labeled Forever Chemicals. Our documentary focused on PFOS contamination stemming from this tannery in Rockford, Michigan, where shoemaker Wolverine Worldwide produced hush puppies. There, beginning in the 1950s, Wolverine treated leather with 3M's Scotchgard and buried the tannery's waste at several nearby sites where it seeped into groundwater. The result? Private wells providing contaminated drinking water to over a thousand nearby homes. Garrett Ellison, a reporter for the news website MLive, took us to one dump site last year. Right now we're at the House Street dump site. This is the 76 acre property where Wolverine in the 60s dumped all of its tannery sludge and which has subsequently uh, caused a major pollution problem in the Belmont area. The test results that we've seen from wells in this area show that this is some of the highest concentration of uh, contamination coming from the dump. And uh, right across the street are homes. In fact, that's uh, Sandy Wynn Stelt's home uh, right there. She's sort of ground zero uh, in terms of uh, contamination in drinking water, hers uh, in the neighborhood is the worst. A year ago, we introduced you to Sandy Wynn Stelt and some of her neighbors, including Jen Carney and Tobin McNaughton. All have contaminated wells, and they met regularly to push government officials for action on PFOS and to help each other cope. It's very therapeutic to get together with these ladies. Nobody's gonna understand but somebody living with it every single day. When they moved into the area, none of them knew that these woods were once an industrial waste dump. Sandy and her husband, Joel, moved into their house in 1992, but in 2016, Joel died of liver cancer. A year later, a team of government workers arrived to tell Sandy her well was highly contaminated with PFOS. And I remember the health department lady was saying things like, well, there seems to be some links to some diseases, thyroid and gout and cancers and liver toxicity. And um, I remember saying, oh my God, my husband just died a year ago of liver cancer. And people really looked worried then. The health effects of PFOS are still being researched, but two PFOS compounds, PFOS and PFOA, have been linked to liver damage, thyroid disease, reproductive harm, and cancer. There are things that are certain. Um, it is certain that you should not drink PFOS. It is certain that it is not good for you. It is certain that it bioaccumulates. It is certain that you will carry it around in your system forever once you have it in there. Even so, there is no federal limit on PFOS in drinking water. Right now, all that there is is a health advisory level, and that's sort of functioned as the de facto standard around the country. That's 70 parts per trillion for PFOS and PFOA. The PFOS and PFOA in Sandy's well tested at over 27,000 parts per trillion. Two missing pieces. Two missing pieces. Tobin and Seth McNaughton live about half a mile south of the House Street dump site. Like Sandy, they unwittingly drank contaminated well water, and so did their three-year-old son, Jack. You want to drink out of a sippy cup now? How did that happen? He's the highest level of PFAS that we know right now of any child in the United States. He gets sick more often and his vac vaccinations haven't worked. One of the worst fears I have is that he's going to have a shorter life due to some kind of cancer or illness that, that could be produced from the PFAS. When we met them last year, Tobin and Seth were trying to have a second child, but twice in the space of a year, Tobin's pregnancies ended in miscarriage. I went to the appointment and she said, I'm sorry, there's, there's no heartbeat here. And I said, I just, I said, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I'm just really, really angry right now. Um, 
and I've cried so much, I think this is why my voice is like this. I, I think that the reason that this is happening to us now is because of PFAS. Sandy, the McNaughtons, and many of their neighbors eventually hired the Grand Rapids law firm Varnum Law to sue Wolverine. And so I need them to take some responsibility and provide us with clean municipal water and to make us whole um, and to take care of all of that for not just me, but for my neighbors. Clean municipal water wasn't far away. After detecting PFAS in one of their wells, nearby Plainfield Township's water department had shut down the contaminated well and installed large carbon filters that can absorb PFAS. Right now, we can process 9 million gallons a day and take out PFAS, and we have taken it down to non-detect. But extending water mains to all of the affected homes would cost tens of millions of dollars. So we asked Wolverine for that, and We've been in negotiations with Wolverine, and they said in good faith, yeah, that sounds like a good deal, but they recently backed off from that. In December of 2018, Wolverine said they wouldn't pay unless Scotchgard maker 3M contributed too. In response, Plainfield Township and nearby Algoma Township joined with the state of Michigan to sue Wolverine. When we broadcast the Forever Chemicals in March of 2019, the township's lawsuit and the affected residents' lawsuits were unresolved, and neither the state nor the federal government had any enforceable limits on PFAS contamination in drinking water. But in the years since, PFAS litigation and regulation have moved forward. In January 2020, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and Attorney General Dana Nessel held a press conference. I'm proud to be joining Attorney General Nessel today as we hold some of the largest polluters in the nation accountable with regards to PFAS contamination here in Michigan. They announced that the state had filed a lawsuit against 17 chemical companies over PFAS contamination. These defendants' persistent failure to act demand that Governor Whitmer and I take every legal and regulatory action necessary to protect the people and the property of our state. Essentially what Michigan is doing is pursuing polluter pay for the PFAS contamination in the state through pursuing these 17 manufacturers and trying to get some money out of them to pay for the $25 million a year so far uh, cost that the state is fronting for, um, for testing and for cleanup around the state. We contend that these defendants knew that PFAS are toxic and pose substantial health and environmental risk, but also that they intentionally hid this information from us uh, and from our state and from our state residents. Sandy Winstelt and her neighbors are still speaking out and demanding action. That day when they brought in jugs of water, I knew my life had changed. We are really trying to make it relatable so people understand that we had our own daily lives. It can happen to us, it can happen to you. In February 2020, they got some long-awaited news. A federal judge approved a settlement that will eventually bring clean municipal water to most of the homes with contaminated wells. The state of Michigan, Plainfield, and Algoma Township settled uh, their case with Wolverine. And the deal there is that uh, Wolverine is essentially paying $69.5 million for Plainfield Township to expand its municipal water system uh, throughout most of the 25 square mile contaminated zone around Rockford and Belmont where the PFAS is in the groundwater. The next day, Scotchgard maker 3M agreed to pay Wolverine $55 million to help pay for the new water lines. I don't know who else would be forced to pay for it. It's not fair for taxpayers to have to fund this. I didn't make this mess, so of course they should be responsible for paying for it. In separate press releases, 3M and Wolverine commented on the settlements. A 3M vice president said, environmental stewardship is core to 3M, and we are committed to developing and contributing to PFAS solutions guided by sound science, responsibility, and transparency. Wolverine's chairman, CEO, and president commented, we have been committed from the very beginning to being part of comprehensive water quality solutions for the community Wolverine has called home for nearly 140 years. 
We are pleased the court has approved this consent decree that provides a structure for our work to continue and also pleased that 3M is contributing towards our efforts. The McNaughton's were lead plaintiffs among more than 250 lawsuits filed over PFAS contamination. And the day after 3M settled with Wolverine, the McNaughton's settled with both companies for an undisclosed amount. I'm really, really happy for the McNaughton's. I can't imagine um, the relief that they must feel for that. The rest of us are not sure what that means for us. So you're kind of in limbo right now until everybody can make decisions about this and figure out what it means next. Wolverine had no comment on the confidential settlement, but the McNaughton's did share a personal update with Great Lakes Now. On January 24th, the family welcomed a new baby boy, Bruce. They're just like the cutest little family. <laughs> that was so exciting because we know, you know what she had gone through to get to that point. In Washington, some lawmakers are pushing for action on PFAS. I got sworn in over a year ago into Congress, and one of the first things that I started working on was the issue of PFAS. In 2019, Michigan Representative Alyssa Slotkin introduced and passed the PFAS Monitoring Act, requiring the EPA to test municipal water supplies for at least 30 different PFAS compounds. Some feel the EPA's own progress on PFAS has been too slow. Good morning, everyone. The agency released their PFAS action plan in February of 2019, but although their latest update reports they've made significant progress, the agency has not set a maximum contaminant level for PFAS in drinking water. They have only issued preliminary determinations to regulate PFOA and PFOS. The EPA did recently say they're going to be regulating PFOS and PFOA in drinking water, but they didn't offer a time frame for how long that would take, and most people think it would be, you know, three to four to five years at, at best. I think the big thing that we really have a problem with with the EPA right now is they refuse to set a standard um, for drinking water for what is healthy and what is not healthy. Um, and uh, that's a problem. In the absence of a federal standard, the state of Michigan has begun to take action. Steve Sliver is executive director of MPART, the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. We're impatient. We found it already in our waterways, and we've already got the advice from experts that there's a problem, uh, potential health problems with these. EPA's timeline for developing their standards is way too long. Michigan's own proposed maximum contaminant levels have been moving through the approval process and could soon become law. We have standards, proposed standards for seven compounds, more than any other state. So if we have this, the timeline that we're hoping for, we will have uh, promulgated drinking water standards for seven PFAS compounds in Michigan in May. The proposed rules would establish some of the toughest PFAS standards in the country and would mean cleanup of PFAS contaminated groundwater would need to meet more stringent standards. Firefighting foam used at airports and air bases has also been a source of PFAS contamination in groundwater around the country. In February, Representative Slotkin questioned Secretary of Defense Mark Esper about his department's willingness to comply with Michigan's forthcoming PFAS standards. The state of Michigan is currently reviewing setting up our own statewide PFAS standard. Once enacted and officially promulgated, will you commit to living up to Michigan's statewide standards? I, I think if that's our regulation driven by law, we'd be uh, required to, but let me come back and give you a formal answer to make sure. Yeah, I think the people of Michigan would love a formal answer because right, we're moving I'm, ahead. I'm lawyer, it's happening, it? it's happening. Okay. To me, that was an important step to say that if you're going to be active and here in our state, when we love having the military here, they're gonna need to, to clean up and they're gonna need to live by our standards. PFAS contamination has been found in all eight Great Lakes states and in Ontario and Quebec, but government response has varied widely. In Minnesota, PFAS contamination was discovered in 2003 near dump sites that had been used by 3M. In 2007, the state established health risk limits for PFOA and PFOS. Since then, limits on other PFAS compounds have been added, and existing limits have been lowered several times. Pennsylvania set PFAS standards for soil and groundwater in 2019, but for drinking water, the state follows the EPA's health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion for just two compounds. 
the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency began testing the state's 1,500 municipal water supplies in February of 2020 and expected to finish by the end of the year. In 2018, Canada set maximum acceptable concentrations of 200 parts per trillion for PFOA and 600 parts per trillion for PFOS, much higher than the EPA's standard of 70 parts per trillion. Like Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and New York have proposed drinking water standards for certain PFOS compounds, but none have been adopted yet. Thanks for watching. For more on how states and communities around the Great Lakes are responding to PFOS, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you.